British Prime Ministers were used to just one kind of message from the IRA. But when John Major moved into Downing Street, he was in for a surprise. I'd been Prime Minister for two days, I think, when a letter arrived from Gerry Adams of Sinn Féin. It was a dear John. It struck me, something I just read somewhere, that Ho Chi Minh, or someone like that, had, had through all the decades for the liberation of Vietnam had continuously written to the colonial part. And it just struck me that, that here, here we were and you know, we'd never made any attempt to proactively engage with the British Prime Minister. It was the uh, Sinn Féin case in straightforward terms that uh, he believed that the British should leave uh, Ireland and there should be a united Ireland. There just seemed a flavour about the letter. It might be possible that Sinn Féin were looking for a way out of the last 20 years, that they were looking for a way to end the violence. But Sinn Féin's partners, the IRA, were not. In broad daylight, the terrorists mounted a daring attack that struck at the very heart of government. We had a cabinet meeting on the Gulf War, and the War Cabinet, the most senior, most uh, involved members of the Cabinet were there with senior civil servants, Robin Butler and many others. We were discussing, as it happens at that moment, the risk of Iraqi terrorist action in London and whether there was any possibility that uh, they would launch terrorist attacks. And I remember very vividly that the last word John Major used before the explosion was the word bomb. From their transit van, abandoned askew just 200 yards from where the war cabinet was meeting, they launched a mortar attack that only narrowly missed their target. I was sitting right next to John Major at the cabinet table. I put my hand on his head quite instinctively and pushed him down under the table. Indeed, I was going down pretty fast myself, and various other members of the war cabinet were adopting not altogether heroic poses. Uh, hardly surprising. And we stayed uh, crouched under the table for a short while and then we left and went to different parts of the building. I went down to a secure room. I knew enough about this drill to know what was happening and reckoning this was the safest place, I uh, stuck by him and uh, we got into this uh, safe room. And the press was told that the war cabinet had continued almost without a break. Well, that was one way of putting it. But it was very close. Another 10 or 12 feet nearer and it would actually have come through the cabinet window and half the cabinet, I think, would have uh, perhaps not survived it. The IRA's mortar attack put an end to Adam's peace initiative, for the moment. By the early 1990s, over 3,000 people had been killed on all sides in the Northern Ireland Troubles. The politics of violence were all too simple. For the most part, the Catholic minority wanted to rejoin the Irish Republic, and the IRA were fighting for that cause. The Protestant majority, the Unionists, wanted Northern Ireland to continue as part of the United Kingdom, and Protestants too had their extreme wing, the Loyalists, with their own paramilitaries who would kill for their cause. I, I led from the front. I mean, I was not an armchair general. Johnny Adair's loyalist force avenged a recent killing of Protestant workers by shooting up a betting shop in a Catholic area of Belfast. Five died. That was just a message to the, to the Republic, is that you do this to us, and we'll do this to you. Again, that's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. 
people are part of this. A brother of mine in the tell me he's dead. Our brother's dead. Too many gun men. That's what the motto about Northern Ireland today. Too many of them. The loyalists, including Adair, who like to be called Mad Dog, increasingly targeted Sinn Féin activists. The Ulster Freedom Fighters trained the recruits and armed them heavily and took the war for once till the IRA and Sinn Féin. The Sinn Féin election worker was shot dead as he sat in his car. No doubt that the UFF is intensifying its violent campaign against the Republican At Party. One loyalist gunman wearing a mask opened fire from close range. These Sinn Féin people went across the border until the heat died down because the Ulster Freedom Fighters was so effective. The loyalists began to outkill the IRA. We certainly felt we were winning the war. When we saw the tricolour over the coffin, uh, the burying gloves on top of that, yeah, we felt encouraged that these people are not unbeatable, that they bleed the same as we bleed, and they will die the same as we die. We're getting to them bastards. And the answer to the provost at that time was, F off. No way. The IRA had offered a deal so that they could concentrate on the British. 25 years of war had brought them no closer to their goal of a united Ireland. Jerry Adams' letter to John Major had been an attempt to open a dialogue with the main enemy. For the British government, Sinn Féin and the IRA were the same, terrorists. And governments never negotiate with terrorists. So for three years, Sinn Féin leaders and the British had been eyeing each other across the violence. To have any hope of bringing it to an end, they needed someone to make the link between them. I have a memory of the need to move out of that frustration, of knowing that people were gathered in the same room but with their backs to each other and that we were probably the only people who could make them turn around and face each other. That we, that was now our role to do that. What the link did next was to transform the peace process into a real-life spy thriller starring former IRA Chief of Staff Martin McGuinness, two British Secret Service agents and a back channel so secret that only the Prime Minister and a few close colleagues knew of it. Early in 1993, Northern Ireland's top civil servant, based here in Stormont Castle, received a visit from his spymaster, the late John Deverell. I remember John Deverell arriving at a particularly useful time. I think the sun had just gone over the yard arm, and he did have um, this message through the link, which contained the potentially quite dramatic phrase, as it were, authorised by Martin McGuinness. The crucial words were, the conflict is over, but we need your advice on how to bring it to a close. My immediate reaction, um, apart from pouring John a decent-sized Bushmills, and also one for myself, they ended up much smaller, was to tell the Prime Minister as well as the Secretary of State. At face value, it looked as though we really were, as John Chilcott suggested, um, nearer to an end to violence than uh, we'd been for the last 20 years. It was a message I was delighted to receive, but it immediately raised questions. Was it authentic? The Prime Minister asked us quite explicitly, was this message authentic? Did it come from McGuinness? Was McGuinness speaking for the IRA leadership? And what we told him was, having worked it through and done some digging, um, yes, it was authentic. It was from McGuinness and it was spoken with authority. But they'd got it wrong. I sent no such message, and uh, sent no message which in any way indicated that that was a mood of Republicans at that time. The message was in fact written by The Link, three Catholics in Derry, one close to the IRA, one particularly trusted by the Secret Service, and Martin McGuinness' former priest, Dennis Bradley. I was sitting at the desk, I was the one with the pencil, and I am inclined to be the writer among the three anyway, because if the rest of it had written it, I would have said the grammar's not good enough. <laughs> um, 
So we, we all spoke about it, talked about it, threw out sentences and so forth. But we didn't use those words, the war is over. But we put them, and I put them in a vague, vague way that this conflict was now coming to an end. The link's route to the British government was through the local British intelligence officer, previously Michael Oatley. The new man was a Secret Service agent they all knew as Fred. We send it, we give it to Fred. I will swear to the day I die that Fred added the words, we need help to get out of this conflict. I think Fred knew that with those words, he could turn the rest of the people in the room round to engage with each other. And Fred was doing what we were doing and adding on to it to make sure that it happened. Downing Street swallowed it and began to work out how to respond. What we sought to do was to put ourselves in the minds of Adams and McGuinness. The question was whether these people were generals in, a, uh, in, a, in an opposing force in military terms or whether they had truly recognized that uh, a military approach was not going to get them what they wanted and that they were now going to try to lead their followers down a political road. So we had to assess that. I took the very cautious view. I was deeply suspicious, having, having had no direct dealings with McGuinness or the IRA in the past. And I, I found myself spelling out what seemed to me the obvious, very, very high risk in this, and that it wasn't something that John should embark upon. The Home Secretary was taking the traditional line. For two decades, British governments had vilified the IRA. Other ministers now argued that they should change the rules, whatever the political risk. So we decided to send uh, a pretty uh, substantive and pretty encouraging reply. We didn't brush their letter aside. And I think the tone of the reply, as much as the substance of the reply, encouraged the possibility that we might move further. A Prime Minister's reply was sent off on a Friday evening, but before it reached the IRA, another bomb in England. Big bombs going off in Bridge Street in bins. People are getting hurt and killed. Bombs? Yes, bombs going off in bins. <laughs> Two just gone off. Two have now gone off? Yes. Go so sold on a second. We were in the presence of a hard cop, soft cop kind of um, uh, approach. And I knew well enough, of course, that there was a school of thought in Republican circles that said the only way to get the Brits to move is to kick them. Was this the Brits being kicked? Nothing could have been less propitious at that moment. I very seriously considered pulling the plug on the whole enterprise and just dropping it. I was very close to it indeed when I saw the real horror of what had happened at Warrington. You're asking, a, say, in John Major's case, I mean, an English prime, a British prime minister, an Englishman, you know, to try to reach a judgment about the potential direction of development of Republican politicians query former terrorists. And that's a big gap to judge across. And so you need some bits of evidence to help you to cross it. The permanent secretary set out to provide the evidence. He instructed Fred to ask for proof of the IRA's good faith, a short ceasefire. If there were to be um, an agreement that events on the ground would be favorable for a period of weeks, then they could be guaranteed that there would be direct dialogue. So it was more than, if you like, a test of the Republican leadership's capability to control their own movement um, and the wish to do that, but also an indication of where they were heading. The Secret Service agents decided to break all the rules and put the request for a ceasefire to Martin McGuinness in person. They agreed, two men on each side. Fred told the link he would come with his boss, John Deverell. But when the day came, Three days after the Warrington atrocity, the top man wasn't there. Here we were, we had been told that uh, there would be two representatives. We knew who the two representatives uh, would be. And uh, at, at the very last minute, one of them pulls out. Not a very good start, in my opinion. 
I do remember driving through through Derry um, to the house where I knew Martin McGuinness was, and I remember thinking, oh, here goes again. Um, it's not very good on the nerves, that type of situation. But Fred came with me. I do remember thinking, you're a brave man. I remember thinking, this is, you know, if I was in your position, would I do this? Anyway, we arrived, it was kind of duskish. The lights were on in the city. And Martin opened the door. And I think before he knew what was happening, I had Fred in the sitting room with myself. Here you had a representative of uh, the Tory government uh, face to face with uh, the Sinn Féin leadership. We discussed it out, myself and Martin, and uh, said, well, look, it's come this far. It is significant. Uh, we're not happy with it. We need to tell him we're not happy with it. But if the guy is here, we need to do the meeting. So, so we sat at, at the table, and uh, I think all of us were very conscious of the hugely symbolic nature of what was happening. I don't know how long Fred talked but it was as good a performance as I think I've ever experienced in my life. He was superb. He said, the British government was now of the mind that this engagement had to take place with Republicans and that it had to take place with integrity, that it wasn't going to be without its difficulties, that it wouldn't roll the whole situation over overnight, that things wouldn't change overnight, but that this was going to take place and this was not going to stop this time. Fred was uh, was very keen to persuade us that the British government were serious about uh, engaging in uh, real and meaningful uh, negotiations with us. Within the whole new changing Europe, within the different relationships between the British and Irish islands at the moment, that there's inevitability that is taking place that there's an inevitable change, and then that inevitable change is going to result in some form of unity. British government's attitude about Ireland was that Ireland should be as one, and those were his exact words. Fred then put forward the request for a ceasefire, but he chose not to use the word. He indicated to us that they wished uh, events on the ground to quieten for a period of uh, several weeks, I think two weeks was mentioned uh, specifically. Fred said, now we realise that you have difficulties with that. So what we are proposing, and it was a very definite proposal, was that the minute that we were told that that ceasefire was about to happen, discussions could ha begin happening one minute afterwards. In other words, if the ceasefire was called at nine o'clock on a Monday morning, we could engage in discussion one minute after nine o'clock. Fred was um, very exact, you know. He was very definitive about that. You know, he was very. He did not want us to take any ambiguity out of what he was saying. You know. McGuinness took the proposal for a ceasefire deal back to his colleagues. We can't rule it out, and we could also see merit in the IRA taking the moral high ground. Part of what we were eventually arguing was, look, there are times when there aren't any IRA operations for a month or for longer periods. So, you know, if, if this happens sometimes just in the ebb and flow of armed struggle, why not do it in a, in, a, in a deliberate way? But first, to demonstrate the alternative to talking, the IRA sent another message to the British government by truck. The massive bomb in the heart of London's financial centre caused more than $500 million worth of damage, more than all their other bombs put together. But at the same time, the IRA were still considering the British request for a ceasefire. They summoned the Dairy Link to a safe house. 
Martin McGuinness arrived at the meeting and he began to read out dictated statement. He took it from little bits and pieces of things that he had in a pocket here and a pocket inside and so forth. I don't know how he constructed it, but it obviously was written in a kind of coded fashion, which he then uh, decoded. Uh, and I was given the task of writing it down on a piece of paper to be printed up to be given to the British with a very strong warning that no, not one single word of this was to be changed. The contact, like ourselves, understood the hugely important significance of this. This was mould-shattering. And the words were actually put a two-week ceasefire. And I remember thinking, it's over. I remember the elation of that moment. I remember the change inside my stomach. I remember the sensation of knowing that this is the beginning of the end. Um, that things will never, ever be the same again. Because now two massive changes have taken place. First of all, the British have engaged, and secondly, Republicans have now offered the ceasefire to begin the process of engagement. And that changes all things for all times. The IRA were, were prepared to take this absolutely massive step for them and uh, bring about a period of quiet and in effect accede to a request from a British government and that was absolutely huge, immense, massive within the process. McGuinness and I had many a battle but he always knew where I was coming from and I think he trusted that that night. And I think I'll be eternally grateful for that. What the IRA was offering was a two-week break in the bombing campaign in exchange for direct negotiations between Sinn Féin and the British government. With the House of Commons sitting late, the Prime Minister called together a few key colleagues. We met in my room late at night to decide how we should actually reply to the Republican movement. I think John Major felt that he was entitled to something more than a mere two-week ceasefire. The letter of the wording perhaps um, didn't take the Republican leadership if they were ever put to the question by their end supporters any further than that. But I think all the contextual surround would be that this ceasefire, if it, um, if it prospered in terms of getting into dialogue, would then be extended indefinitely and would be, as it were, the end to violence. I wanted to see this taken forward. I was Secretary for Northern Ireland, and I'm not suggesting that, that um, the Prime Minister didn't. The Prime Minister naturally wanted to think harder. They had said the conflict is over. They had initiated the exchanges. And yet they had also let off a bomb at Warrington. They had also let off a bomb in the city. And that, in a sense, raises the price for a British government to enter into dialogue. And part of the payment of the price is in time. A mere two weeks with no violence gave no sense of confidence to any British minister that one should go on, but uh, an adequate period where they demonstrated they could stop the violence, uh, that was probably sufficient for the next cautious steps. And we fixed upon the period of three months. That, we thought, was a sufficient firebreak. It was not too long to be a deterrent, not too long to look like a government ploy, but a sufficient period for them to show their good faith. But before the Prime Minister's demand for a three-month ceasefire could be communicated, the IRA struck again at Belfast's Opera House. Well, I mean, one after another after another, at a time, uh, a time comes and it came after the Opera House one, when I'm afraid everybody said, well, that's it, at least for the time being, that's it. The whole idea of negotiations with the Republicans was put on hold. I sat back, the days passed, I made contact with a contact, I said, you know, what's going on here? What's happening? Why has there been no response? What's wrong? Is there a problem? And there was nothing. And then eventually it became clear to me that uh, it wasn't going to happen. Someone else would have to take the lead. And there was someone with a big idea. Another dairyman, 
and Ireland's best-known peacemaker. John Hume, the leader of the main Catholic party in the north, the SDLP, knew nothing of the link. He reckoned that the way to peace was to take account of each party's minimum requirements and to have the British and Irish governments turn them into a declaration of principles. And he began to draft it for them. Hume's idea was that such a joint declaration would tempt the IRA to call a halt to their violence, while leaving the other main players enough to keep them in the act. He started with Jerry Adams. At each occasion that Jerry and I met, we discussed a draft for a joint declaration. Jerry would take that away then and come back with his version of that. The central elements of what we were saying are rest, rested on the right of the people of this island to national self-determination. Republican self-determination, a united Ireland, clashed with the Unionists' idea of self-determination. To remain part of the United Kingdom, but Hume saw a way to avoid the conflict. An agreement was the only way you could get self-determination. The British government were not preventing Irish unity, that the situation was now that Irish unity was a matter for those Irish people who wanted Irish unity, persuading those who didn't. Where, where he's very good is the reality that there is a large number of people here in this part of the island who are pro-union, and you just can't ignore that. I understand the importance of reaching out to the unionists and trying to reshape Ireland in a way which they can have ownership of and which they can give their assent or consent to. The difficulty is when, when that becomes a veto. We obviously wanted uh, the police to withdraw and we wanted a, a time frame for, for police withdrawal. It, I mean, the, the, the crucial parts of it was that it, that it had uh, a time frame in it. Hume had to reconcile Sinn Féin's demand for a date for British withdrawal from Northern Ireland with the Anglo-Irish agreement's promise to the Unionists that any change would happen only with the consent of the majority. So he took the draft joint declaration to the man he hoped could persuade the British to sign up to it, the new Irish Prime Minister, or Taoiseach, Albert Reynolds. When I studied the documents, uh, I felt it was too green. The IRA always held, held their traditional view, Brits out, give us the date. So that runs contrary to the whole principle of consent on which any new project would have to be based. That was the foundation stone of any new project. Uh, how can you say, uh, on the one hand, Brits out, give us the date, and at the same time accept the principle of consent? I don't know that this seemed at all obvious to the Republican movement, but it certainly was absolutely obvious to us. All I can tell you is that John Hume and I signed off and sent what became known as the Hume Adams paper to Dublin and what came back was much more ambiguous. The draft the Dublin government had revised to make it more palatable to the British was rejected by Sinn Féin, who insisted on their own version. I got this draft. This is any progress, but if they insisted and to show my good faith, I was prepared to take the draft or give it to John Major. At their next scheduled summit, the irrepressible salesman made his pitch in person. I gave it my best shot. I said I would, and I did. Uh, and I said that, you know, what was the price of peace, for instance? I mean, was it not worth everybody going the extra mile, taking the extra risk? The one real problem in the document that we discussed over supper was that the document had in it the suggestion of a time frame for British withdrawal from Northern Ireland. And I said to Albert, this isn't going to work. You simply can't do that. The principle of consent in Northern Ireland is absolutely fundamental to any agreement we can have. And there's no possibility of me now, or at any stage in the future, or any British government I can think of, actually agreeing to a time frame to remove ourselves from what we consider part of the United Kingdom. John Major held out absolutely firmly. No good. Never got hot under the collar or anything like that. It was a very friendly meeting, but make no mistake, Albert. No good as you're trying to run it at the moment. As the Taoiseach had predicted, 
the wording of the Hume-Adams draft had been turned down. But Hume's idea of a joint declaration remained. The two governments began to rewrite it in secret. John Hume waited all summer to hear what had happened to his brainchild. In September, Hume had a trip to America planned. He was a frequent visitor to the White House. But just as he was about to leave, he learned that he had been double-crossed. Well, I was told by local people that the British government were making contact with Sinn Féin and the IRA through the local people. We were informing him that, unbeknownst to him, there was other talks taking place. I was surprised that I hadn't been told that the British government were secretly meeting uh, with representatives of the IRA. Uh, and uh, I was fully informing them of my talks with uh, Jerry Adams. The Link had told Hume because they believed the IRA's offer of a ceasefire was being ignored by the British and would be withdrawn. We have to get this out into the public. And we told him the whole story. We all could foresee John Hume walking into the White House and saying to Clinton, excuse me, do you realize that the British asked for two weeks ceasefire and got it and haven't acted upon it, having asked for it? The Lynx plan backfired. John Hume did not publicize the ceasefire offer, but the idea of going public appealed to him. He called on the man with whom he had drafted the joint declaration, Jerry Adams. We frankly didn't know what was happening. The only way to unlock the, the, the little deadlock, the logjam, the minimalist pace, was to say it publicly was to say that the governments had not responded to us. Hume and Adams issued a press release just before Hume left for America, revealing that they had given the Irish government their draft for a joint declaration. This revelation threw a monkey wrench in the works. Almost anything that came out of a dialogue between John Hume and Gerry Adams that then had the support of the government in Dublin, was almost bound to be complete anathema to the Unionists. I'll tell my honourable friend what the fuss is about. John Major had good cause to be concerned about the Unionists. He had only a slender majority and needed their MPs' support, particularly on Europe, where he could not count on his own party. We were just coming up to an absolutely crucial vote in the Maastricht debate. It was a vote so crucial that if we had been defeated upon it, I would have resigned. And it was a couple of hours before I was going to the chamber to speak, and I was finishing the notes for my speech. And the projections from the government whips at that time were that we were likely to lose. The leader of the largest unionist party was invited to number 10 Downing Street. Well, I went over the third delay, and uh, Prime Minister was at the cabinet table where he usually did work with uh, papers in front of him, obviously drafting the speech he was going to make, the most important speech of his career perhaps, within about an hour. And we sat there in silence for a moment. And I was clearly waiting to see what the Ulster Unionists were going to do in this crucial debate that afternoon. And Jim said, I might be able to offer you nine and I said, nine abstentions, which is what I thought he would probably be able to offer. And I said, no, if we're lucky, it might be um, nine, four. So then he did this sort of mock counting sort of thing, <laughs> kind of a joke we had between us about lack of formal education. But that would be 18, so I said, yeah, so it would be right enough. And there was another pause, and he said, but we mustn't do a sordid deal. He seemed rather surprised by that. And I said, of course not, but I'm going to be asked why you have suddenly delivered uh, these crucial votes in this crucial debate. And he smiled wryly and looked around the room. What about telling them the truth then? Which is, uh, I said, nothing was asked for, nothing was given. And I said, great. During the debate, one of our colleagues from Northern Ireland, Seamus Mullen, uh, intervened and said, yeah, yeah. Does not the Prime Minister have a duty today, now, to tell this House 
what deal he did with the nine Ulster Unionists. Sir John just got up and with a broad grin and said, Well, let me uh, clear up the matter for the honourable gentleman, so he was in no doubt. Nothing was asked for, nothing was offered, and nothing was given. <laughs> and I nodded in confirmation and so forth, and that was that. The Ulster Unionist Party leader had earned himself some credit. And three months later, he had occasion to call it in. The Prime Minister invited him back to Number 10 to reveal the British and Irish governments were negotiating a joint declaration. The last time London and Dublin had signed a treaty, the Unionists had gone ballistic. The Prime Minister was alone apart from the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, they both looked a little uneasy. We were apprehensive. Uh, we showed him uh, the uh, document that we'd been working on, uh, which Albert Reynolds had first given us and which we'd amended, uh, to see what his reaction was. First of all, I said to the PM, uh, what, what was the origin of this paper? And Robin Butler looked as if he was going to say something when the Prime Minister said, no, I'll handle this. <laughs> And he said, well, it has come to me from uh, someone who has a fair bit of authority on the other side of the fence. And that was all he said. So then I said... It's a very green document. It's a, it's a very Republican document. There's a lot of Hume speak in here. And he clearly didn't think it was a draft upon which we could do business. John Major decided to put aside the joint declaration for the time being. Then, five days later, one of Northern Ireland's worst weeks of violence erupted. On a busy Saturday afternoon, the IRA bombed a fish shop in Belfast's Protestant heartland, the Shankill Road. People were getting in their food for the weekend and come home dead like that for a lot of scum. As every emergency crew in the city converged on the scene, bodies began to be brought out. I counted five in the first half an hour, more followed. The Ulster Freedom Fighters had their headquarters above the fish shop. The bomb had been set to kill their area commander, Johnny Adair, but it went off prematurely. The victims were Protestants buying fish. People were just... Got it. Went down up the scene, it went down the rubble, it was just a scene of horror and sadness at what was taken out of that rubble. The UFF warned ominously tonight they would retaliate, saying the Catholic community would pay a heavy price for today's atrocity. I got a phone call on a Tuesday night and keep yourself free for Saturday. There was going to be an operation carried out in retaliation. The Ulster Freedom Fighters selected a remote bar used by Catholics in the village of Greysteel on Halloween. We were going to actually shoot up a pub. Spray the bar with gunfire. And that was to, to kill as many people as possible. They were using an AK and a 9mm and the AK was having two magazines and the 9mm was going to have two magazines. So I knew that was going to be a pretty severe shooting. The getaway car dropped the gunman in the village. We reached the bar, myself and the other gunman got out and we went into the bar. One shouted, trick or treat. I remember one of the customers saying something. She was shot first. And then shooting. I fired my gun once. Well, it was pandemonium. The, and the whole place was screaming. Everybody was screaming. Things seemed to be mo going in slow motion. Um, I, I can't remember hearing gunfire. But I knew that there was gunfire happening. It seemed to be ages. In fact, it was just a matter of seconds, minutes. 
That's not over in two minutes. Two minutes, four bursts of uh, machine gun fire. All over. Seven people dead. The killers rejoined their getaway car. I do actually remember seeing a sea of blue lights flashing, the sirens or the emergency vehicles, and thinking to myself, what have I done? Mm -hmm. The first cortege passed the bar where the loyalist gunmen fired their weapons on people out for a quiet Saturday night drink. And it seemed the whole community had turned out to pay their respects. The SDLP leader, John Hume, was among those attending. A young girl who was one of the families that had lost a loved one came up to me and said to me, Mr. Hume, we prayed for you last night in our house uh, and we prayed that you would be successful in the work that you're doing and so that it will not happen. What happened to us will not happen to anybody else. A wave of revulsion swept across Northern Ireland. Jerry Adams carried the coffin of one of the fish shop bombers who had been blown up by his own bomb. The television pictures identified Adams squarely with the terrorists. I just knew that I had to go to the funeral. That wasn't an issue. And I knew when I went to the funeral, what was I to say? You know that I wouldn't carry the guy's coffin? That would be a huge, uh, a huge insult to his family. And we have to remember that he had a... Uh, parents and family as well. But behind the headlines, the vicious circle of violence was forcing the leaders to try harder. When the Taoiseach met the Prime Minister two days later, he was desperate to bring the joint declaration back to life. We'll have this afternoon, I think. Oh, yeah, I think. We'll uh, sit down this afternoon and see what we have. We sat down, just the two of us, and I said, John, look, what you have to understand is this is that if this man didn't carry that coffin, he couldn't deliver that movement. He's no good to you or me if he didn't carry that coffin. And I understood that, but it didn't mitigate the feelings that people had. And that bomb destroyed any vestige of a possibility that the unionist community would accept anything that had um, a Hume Adams label on it. And I said to him in terms, Albert, this has got to be the two governments. We can't be seen to be dancing to the strings of any third party. I was quite prepared to say it clearly and unequivocally, Hume Adams' document, no, it is not on the table, it's gone. And uh, I was doing that to make sure that the document that the two governments had exchanged was still on the table. The two prime ministers issued a statement that despite John Hume's courageous and imaginative efforts, they would not adopt or endorse the Hume Adams proposal. The Prime Minister describes me in that statement as courageous and imaginative. Why has he rejected my proposals before he has talked to me about them? I reached the conclusion, as we set out in the statement over the weekend, that it was not the right way to proceed. And it was a very lonely moment for John Hume and myself sitting on those benches because the two Prime Ministers had actually, if I can use a political term, shafted him. I met John Major in the bar in the House of Commons a few days later and I walked up to him and caught him by the coat. He took me by the lapels, very emotionally seeking a peace in Northern Ireland, but it passionately mattered to him, and said, you can achieve it. If you accept that document and make that joint declaration, there will be peace within a week, yes. And I said, Gladstone failed, Lloyd George failed, and Churchill failed. If you succeed, you will go down in history as the Prime Minister who brought peace to Ireland. Take the leap. The Prime Minister did leap, 
but not Hume's way. He finally replied to the IRA's offer of a ceasefire, but on his terms. And he announced this at an event guaranteed to attract maximum television coverage. If the IRA end violence for good, then after a sufficient interval to ensure the permanence of their intent, Sinn Féin can enter the political arena as a democratic party and join the dialogue on the way ahead. John Major also sees the initiative on a second front. Only days before he was due to meet the Irish Prime Minister, he dispatched the Cabinet Secretary to Dublin with a bombshell, a radically different version of the Joint Declaration. The version, according to John Major, shifted the emphasis from courting Republicans to reassuring Unionists and toned down the rhetoric about a united Ireland. Robin Butler came over to see me on a Friday night, late on a Friday night. Uh, they asked me to stay in the office, and I did. And he produced this new document. I could tell from his body language when he got it that this wasn't going to go down very well. And he opened it, and he uh, glanced through it. And um, he pretty well exploded immediately. I, I, I lost my temper with him. I got very angry. And I said, look, I never, ever will join you in that strategy. And I am not, under any set of circumstances, going to start with a new document here and now. I got a bigger roasting from him than uh, I ever had uh, in any meeting with a member of another government. And I'm quite sure Albert Reynolds knew exactly what he was doing when he was giving me that roasting. And eventually I got it out of Robin Butler that they wanted a total reversal of strategy. They wanted me to join with them in taking on the IRA and how we were going to tackle them. They were never going to do this and all of that. And I just, you know, I just could not believe my ears. After all that, I then had to break to him uh, that uh, this uh, story about uh, our approach from the... IRA and our contacts with them and the reason why we'd had to keep those uh, secret. The news the cabinet secretary had to break was that the Observer newspaper would be running a scoop that Sunday, the story of John Major's dealings with the IRA through the Derry Link. And here they were, for a number of years, talking behind the scenes. Me never told, the Irish government never told, and here we are in, in, in confidential discussions. I, I just couldn't believe it. I said, you know, I'm not taking that and I'm not buying it. If that's the idea that you have in coming forward to a summit, which was due fairly soon, I says, forget it. The furor in the press killed the dairy link with the IRA for good. So when the scheduled Anglo-Irish summit took place in Dublin a week later, both governments realized the joint declaration was the only way forward. To make it work, the Irish needed enough on a united Ireland to satisfy Sinn Féin. The British needed enough on the consent principle to satisfy the Unionists. It started badly. Reynolds was furious to find Major still pursuing the new British draft. The two prime ministers met alone. Look, I said, John, this is bad faith in any sense of the word. I can't buy it, I won't buy it, we'll have no summit, and we'll leave it at that, if that has to be it. And we sat down, and he sat down there looking at me, in a bit of a sulk, I think, over the problems we'd had. And, you know, I says, you know, am I being fooled all the time? Am I being fooled by my friend John Major all the time? I mean, is this, is it, was this an act that we were going through over previous months? And I had a big pile of uh, papers under my arm, which I <coughs> slammed down on the table. And I said, where do you think this came from, Albert? You know the difficulty this caused with the Unionists. Whereabouts did that come from? Couldn't have come from London. Must have come from Dublin. What did he take me for? A stupid effing so-and-so, you know? When this sort of nonsense breaks all over the press, how can I stop the Unionists believing that we're reaching all sorts of deals that they would never find acceptable? If this goes on, we just won't reach a deal. You know, that's the way it was. It was high-temper stuff. I mean, you know... I was standing close to the door uh, when uh, the Taoiseach came out. Um, and I, I said to him, how did it go, Taoiseach? And he said something like, ah, grand, grand, grand. And I said, well, was it tough? And he's, he's again, he said something like, well, he chewed the bollocks off me, but I took a few lumps out of him. 
the two prime ministers had agreed to marry their rival drafts. I remember saying to uh, Albert, pointing to the document, and said, well, where are the constitutional guarantees we were promised? And Albert picked up the document and looked at it, and he said, well, they're in there. They're a bit oblique, but they're in there. And I said, look, principle of consent is there. We, it's enshrined in the Anglo-Irish agreement. It's there in the document. It's there a number of times in the document in various ways. You might prefer to have it up in lights, but it's just not possible to do that. Oh, well... Uh, no, the Irish view was, it's there, it's implicit, but don't go and sort of spell it all out or you'll frighten the horses. And Paddy Mayhew said, well, the reference to United Ireland isn't a bleak, that's uh, quite explicit. We've got to take great care of our audience. Each side accepted they had to help the other. The two prime ministers instructed their officials to find ways round the remaining difficulties and put on a public show of how it should be done. We've we, committed, oh, yeah. gone. We, we've we committed, committed ourselves, ourselves today. <laughs> there you are, you see. You can now see. You can now see the extent to which we're working together. <laughs> go on, you go first. Mental telepathy. <laughs> the officials did as they were bid. But still, every dot and comma was fought over. Even Britain's statement first made three years earlier that they had no selfish strategic or economic interest in Northern Ireland. We thought that that phrase would be immeasurably strengthened by the inclusion of a comma between the words selfish and strategic. Um, and we tried very hard to get that comma in. I, I would tend to be somebody who um, um, puts in more rather than less commas. And of course it would have been strengthened. It would have, it would have, I mean there were people even then in the Republican movement saying to us they mightn't have any selfish strategic interest but do they have an unselfish strategic interest in Northern Ireland? And we felt that since it was our statement we ought to be able to put it the way we wanted to and in the end the Irish government accepted that. As the joint declaration was reaching its final form, John Major arranged a late-night rendezvous with the Ulster Unionist Party leader, James Molyneux. He was pretty apprehensive at first as he began to uh, read through the document. In particular, he would have liked us to have taken out no selfish or strategic interest. He said, but you know why it's got to be there? I said, yes, I know why it's there. Britain's no selfish interest in remaining in Northern Ireland. We're not a colonial power any longer. And he looked at me in a typical Jim way and said, I won't expostulate about this, and that really was as much as we could have hoped. Ten days before Christmas, Reynolds flew to London for the signing ceremony of the Downing Street Declaration. The final text was a masterpiece. Skillfully, it reconciled the conflicting claims, and all in one key paragraph. It is for the people of Ireland alone by agreement between the two parts respectively, to exercise their right of self-determination on the basis of consent, freely and concurrently given, north and south, to bring about a united Ireland, if that is their wish. It makes no compromise on strongly held principles, but it does embody a common view that there is an opportunity to end violence for good in Northern Ireland. This is a historic opportunity for peace. We hope that everybody will grasp it. The Downing Street Declaration was intended to usher in an era of peace and goodwill in Northern Ireland. But did it offer enough even to secure the first step, ceasefire? for this program was provided by the Stratford Foundation. 
and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.